Okay, Dan's recording. We are honored tonight that these two very busy professional ladies have found time out of their packed schedules to share the history and ongoing activities of the Kingsborough and Lisa Matthews Bays. Lisa Lord, a wildlife biologist and chair of the Kingsbury Bay, currently serves also as the conservation's programs director at the Longleaf Alliance. Sudi Thomas, a wildlife biologist and chair of the Lisa Matthews Bay, also works for the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Both have a long history of working on restoration projects. They've also been longtime members of the South Carolina Native Plant Society. Ladies, the floor is yours. Okay, hey, Native Plant Society. Um, I'm just gonna tell you all a little bit about the Lisa Matthews Memorial Bay that the Native Plant Society owns in Bamberg County and um, some of the uh, happenings out there. Um, so this is a photo of the bay with the Canby's drop wort and the, you see it flowering in the background with the white flowers. It's just south of the little Sockahatchee River off of Highway 301, eight miles south of Bamberg. It's 52 acres. Um, it was given to the Native Plant Society by the Nature Conservancy in 2003. And I think before that it was donated by the family of Lisa Matthews to the, Native, to the Nature Conservancy. And the primary goal out there is um, restoration of the, the wetlands and the habitat for the federally endangered species, um, Canby's drop wart. And we're also trying to um, manage the uplands and restore the um, longleaf and wiregrass habitat there. So here's a map. Um, you can see here's the bay right here, right off of 301. So if you're driving down 301, you can just stop along the side of the road and peek into the woods. And depending on the time of the year, you might see pickerel weed in May or in irises in April and Canby's dropwort in July. Um, and just another map over here shows you if anybody's ever been to Cathedral Bay, it's just a little south down here. Um, so here's a photo of the interior um, of the bay. It, the dominant woody plants include pond cypress, swamp tupelo, myrtle leaf holly, red maple, and button bush. Um, but there's a, a really um, diverse herbaceous plant community as well. Um, and the species there are uh, tolerant of prolonged inundation. The two dominant grasses in the deep part of the bay are southern cut grass and maiden cane. Weekly states that the, the southern cut grass is uncommon in the Carolinas and describes the habitat as clay-based Carolina bays, lime sink ponds, lakes, pools, and in places with periodically or seasonally um, that are inundated. And then on the right, you can see just a list of species that have been found out there. There's there's and probably many more that we haven't identified yet. And then um, Canby's drop wart is the host of the black swallowtail butterfly. You can see this blurry picture I took, not very good. Um, so just some more photos of the Canby's drop wart from the bay. Uh, it's a, again, it's federally endangered. It's in the carrot family, APACE. Um, and you find it in coastal plain habitats. Um, isolated wetlands, Carolina bays, wet pond savannas, shallow pineland ponds, and cypress pond swamps or sloughs. And um, so the most vigorous populations of Canby's dropwort are found in open bays or ponds that are wet throughout most of the year, but have little or no canopy. So they do better with a lot of sunlight. And they have um, sandy soils or sandy loams acidic peat mucks underlain by clay by a clay layer which causes the retention of water. So uh, here are some photos of the typical um, these more distinct Carolina bays you see with these crisp sandy rims um, but they're as we know they're all over the Carolinas and um, Occipolis cambii and the entire wetland ecosystem it inhabits is rare and endangered. In South Carolina, over 90% of Carolina bays, over three acres have been ditched or destroyed. And this is very old data, so it's probably even worse now. And across the Southeastern coastal plain as a whole, over a third of all rare plant species recognized by state heritage programs inhabit depressional wetlands. And um, so some of the, 
the goals of this um, Plant Conservation Alliance is collecting seed, propagating, and you know, uh, restoring these habitats for Cambys dropwort. So this is a map from the USDA Plants Database, and this was in my very old presentation and I went to look to see if it was updated, but it's not. So this is still the same map, but it does show you that um, Cambys dropwort is endangered in several other states in the range and it ranges from New Jersey down to Florida. Just a little bit more about the, um, the habitat and where it's found from NatureServe and the Center for Plant Conservation. Um, it's a perennial aromatic herb with quill-like leaves, slender stems. It reproduces by strong fleshy rhizomes found in the coastal plain and all of the habitats that I've sort of already mentioned. And then over on the right side um, just mentions all these plants that it occurs with and we have probably all of these out of the bay. We have a lot of pond pines here. Um, actually not a lot of pond pine, we have some pond pine. So here's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service information, and this shows the current range. So that's a better map um, than the Plants Database map. But they're, the Fish and Wildlife Service right now is doing their five-year review. So April Punsalan, the botanist with the Fish and Wildlife Service, has been gathering data for that. Um, and so far, uh, they've noted that approximately 53 populations have been documented, but only 14 are confirmed by recent surveys and very few of the sites were in ideal condition. <clears throat> um, the recovery plan calls for 19 populations to be protected and self-sustaining, but only 11 have at least been partially protected and not all are self-sustaining. On the bottom right here, these are the main threats listed in the review. Um, sort of the uh, you know, same threats we've been talking about, alteration of its habitat, altered frequency and depth of surface water, soil moisture, fire suppression, woody plant encroachment, lack of protection, and herbicides. So this is a picture from back in the early days when it was first um, acquired by the Native Plant Society 2000, around 2003. Jeff Glitzenstein and John Brubaker were sort of the pioneers of this project. Um, they found 20 plants growing um, in 2003. They were in waist deep water. And when they found them, evidently it was a relief because it hadn't been seen since 1996. And Patrick McMillan suggested that that might have been because of the drought of the late 1990s and early 2000s. So here's just some photos of the deep water habitats where you, um, sometimes you need your chest waders out there, but John Brubaker likes to call them the gator holes and he likes to talk about the cotton mouths. I think that's to keep people away. Um, but uh, you can see it's just really pretty back in there. We have some really nice buttressed cypress and tupelo trees um, and floating aquatics. And this is just, this is something I think that can be found on the website, uh, the Native Plant Society website. It's a paper by Charles Everett about the soils, hydrology and geom geomorphology of the bay. And he describes it as a wetland depression that lacks the classic elliptical shape of Carolina Bays. It contains deep pond cypress pond, shallow pond cypress savanna. Those are natural community types with pockets of Pocosin at the Bay Edge. And it's sandwiched between two Carolina Bays on somewhat higher ground to the south and east with sandy clay loam and sandy clay textured bottom and the uplands are sandy. So it's got really sandy, um, well-drained upland soils. So here's the bay kind of showing its less distinct shape than some of the other bays in the earlier photo, but it seems like the bays in this area tend to be more irregular. If you look at some of the other ones around. And so the initial goals were to control the hardwood invaders and promote the spread of Oxypolis cambia and other associated herbs. Um, plans were to uh, restore um, the upland vegetation and the first thing I think was to remove the planted lavali pine stand. And the idea there, it was a you know planted timber stand and the idea there was to remove that um, plant long leaf, try to promote a, the native ground cover, but then also by removing the lavali that removes that year round evapotranspiration that happens with that evergreen tree. 
Um, and then it also allows side light. So it's, um, it's thought that the having that side light coming in to the deep water herbaceous uh, standing water is what promotes the cambage or one of the conditions cambage drop work prefers. And so there was some um, seed collection and uh, Jeff, Jeff Glissenstein grew a lot of plants, mainly wiregrass and some other grasses and wildflowers. And these were planted in the uplands. And so that was to restore the habitat, but also to provide fuel for fire. Um, and early activities were funded by a partner's grant from Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is just kind of a rundown that people can kind of, I'm not gonna read everything, but there was um, planting of wiregrass, some hand clearing, several prescribed fires, longleaf planted. And then in 2005, Jeff and John found 217 cambies dropwort plants. So this shows the removal of the pine stand. This is what it looked like in 1999 and then remove those pines and then they're all gone by 2009. And you can see where the, the campus dropwort population is. And then this is a later picture where um, the neighbors cleared their pines too. So you can see that. And then these are our neighbors here. We have um, a hunt club, a little row of trailers here, and then a farm field across the street. So currently we're kind of trying to keep up with the same, the same activities, um, a lot of brush cutting to keep the uh, woody plants from taking over in the uplands. And so that's so we can promote those herbs and then we can uh, prevent the, you know, those woody plants from sucking up water. Continue to uh, monitor the Oxyplus cambii. Um, uh, Jeff continues to grow native appropriate native plants from you know local seed sources and plants them back out there. Um, we've been planting several, we've had several plantings of longleaf. So we're gonna eventually have this a nice sort of uneven age sand. Um, we wanna sort of use it as a, an example to promote um, wetland restoration and you know figuring out those conditions that makes the plant, this federally endangered plant thrive. Um, and some of the recent activities have been funded by, or at least partially funded by um, some farm bill programs. The Wildlife Habitat Incentives Program was used to um, do a lot of mechanical woody removal, some burns and longleaf planting. And then currently we have a conservation stewardship program contract with NRCS to do many of the same practices. And um, we're, I've used it to you know, do plan identification with staff I work with as well. So it's, it's a really nice, um, good example to show people. So here's just some fun pictures of, of some of the activities. This was this major brush cutting that happened um, back in about 2012 with the uh, WIP funds. And you can see how well this wiregrass is done that Jeff planted. And then, so later on after that, we had a, you know, a, a good response from the herbaceous plant community. And you can see this, how it's thin, this, the, the cambies dropboard is in here amongst these cypress. So it did well with that light coming in. So here's some of the upland herbaceous vegetation after the woody mechanical clearing. And then just a couple years later, this is what happens. You have a woody succession. So the shrubs start jumping up, a lot of sweet gum, black cherry, and um, while you know we want to keep this down, while it's like this, you have a lot of shrub nesting birds and other wildlife benefiting from this. Um, there, when it was like this, and it and it goes in cycles, but there's usually painted buntings out there and indigo buntings and blue grosbeaks nesting, and common ground dove. So here's another brush cutting episode. Um, we kind of tried to leave some of the beauty berries and hawthorns and some of the neat stuff and targeted cutting the black cherries, sweet gums, and scrubby oaks. And this was just where we were targeting our brush cutting for that contract. And then a little more brush cutting showing how we're releasing what's underneath. So the wiregrass underneath and then these longleaf were hiding underneath. So prescribed fire, this was one in 2015. And this is after, so before and after, you see the wiregrass clumps and then you see them burn. So, um, and some of this stuff didn't even, 
Oh, this must have been planted. This then we planted um, long leaf right after we burn. That's what happened right there. It, it opened it up nicely for planting. And then this is just later that same year, a couple months later, you have the wiregrass sprouting back. This is Baptisia perfoliata. This is one of the herbs that Jeff planted. And then there's a, another, you know, all the we have a lot of um, herbs that came up from the seed source too, just from the seed bank. Um, Eupatoriums over here. We have. Um, Asclepias tuberosa, Ludwigia, and this one is coral bean, erythrina. And then also Liatris and mountain mint, pycnanthemum, uh, and green and gold. <laughs> kind of an mm. odd thing to be there. Um, and this is the, this is a little bit later in the fall when that, that Baptisia kind of keeps its leaves and more of the dahlia that Jeff planted that's doing really well out there. And you can see our long leaf too coming up. This was a fire in 2018. Joe Cockrell was our burn boss. Um, we start the fire back here on the fire line, the um, fire break. And then, you know, go around and kind of um, let the fire meet. And this, this uh, picture on the bottom right is cool because that's that, per, that Baptisia perfoliata that really went up in flames, I thought it was kind of cool. And then there it is again, it's sprouting right back. And this is goat's rue on the bottom right. And then we have some buckeye coming back and longleaf, of course, thriving after fire. And the corn snake is using the um, burned area and the stump holes. But then even though we burned, um, you can see we're trying to knock back this woody vegetation, but it's sprouting right back too. But it is like putting up these really spindly um, stems. So I think the more we hit it, you know, there it's getting weaker and weaker, and it's easier to go brush cut when there's um, small stems. And then it doesn't all burn, so you do have some of the shrubby habitat left for species that need that habitat. Some more of our beautiful wildflowers out there: um, Dahlia pinnata. Laetris, and this is Lesbadiza um, virginiana, slender Lesbadiza, and more of that Baptisia and goldenrod butterflies. So we've had um, several different episodes of planting longleaf. This one was 2015. We had a crew where we planted a whole bunch of them, but then we also had volunteers. And they had been planted a couple times before that. And I think in some of these sandier, drier areas, um, some of them didn't make it, but I think we've got a good um, stand now. So here's where we, John potted up some long leaf and, you know, kind of got them growing really vigorously before we planted them. And you can see the wiregrass, look at all the seeds after the fire. So more long leaf. And so here's the Camby's drop work um, monitoring efforts. Uh, I first helped in 2007. And we kind of, in 2007, the, the, the Cambridge dropwort was growing in these patches. It was these thick, I don't know if, can you see how skinny these stems are? They would grow in these little clumps and we tried to map them and I was learning how to use my GPS unit. So we just mapped everywhere we found it. And then we walked these transects and kind of extrapolated. And we thought we had about, you know, somewhere over 6,000 stems. And then we tried again in 2009. And so we mapped these clumps the clumps kind of moved around or, you know, there were, there were more clumps kind of expanding and then some of these outliers. And we would try to walk, a, do a polygon around the main population. And then this is 2014. So we have all this data kind of all on top of each other, all these old clumps. And then the, you know, sort of shows the shift in the main population, but it doesn't really spread. It kind of stays in that same, must be the sweet spot right here. And then we decided um, it was getting to be a lot to count. And we set up these permanent plots. So here are the permanent plots. And the idea was we had a really thick plot, a kind of a medium plot and a really sparse plot to get a good rep representation of the density. And we started just counting the um, plants in those plots. And, you know, so we can get an idea of the trends. So here's how we counted it. This is Jeff's uh, method of counting we tie a flag to every stem and then you take the flag off and you count all the flags. And you can imagine in July that that was like really um, 
fun work there, but uh, it works. It works. It, it's a good way to count without, you know, thinking you counted this stem and then you missed that stem or did I count that stem? So um, these are the numbers and we, you know, it kind of showed an upward trend. And if you think about just have, having almost a thousand in just those plots, how many we probably had in the whole area. Um, we, you know, we could extrapolate, um, but we just tried to not to, Def kind of dissuaded us from doing that. So uh, this shows you how thick these stem stems, these patches are. And actually in 2016, we quit counting because it was too thick to count. We couldn't even walk without stepping on the plant. So that photo's by April, it's pretty cool. <clears throat> and we hadn't counted them since. We've just gone out there and said, you know, it's a whole lot, so it's doing pretty well. Here's 2017. 2018, this was early where the stems were just coming up and I could, you could just see them all, you know, emerging. Here's, um, so May is a good time to go see the irises it's coming up. And 2018, just some photos of the Cambys dropwort and then some of the upland, upland plants. Um, so this is a conservation plan map that was made for the site uh, for the conservation stewardship program with the NRCS. So we have to sort of have a plan map showing where we're gonna do everything and how many acres. So prescribed burning, planting longleaf and wildflowers and brush management. And um, so this last time we walked the perimeter, we got these two, these white um, areas. So it seemed like it shrunk a little bit, but it was really thick in these areas. So it's interesting. And there are lots of amphibians out there, lots of frogs calling. Um, now's a good time to go. I think we're going soon, Lisa. We'll have, we need to go, need to camp out and listen for what's <laughs> calling. Um, this is 2019. They're just so thick, they're falling over. And just a little bit about, I talked about the animal life a little bit, but um, just pointing out that we have a lot of great habitat for songbirds, um, beneficial insects, including pollinators, and then lots of food out there for wildlife, beauty berry, lesbodesas. Um, it's just got some really good habitat for a lot of species. So this is a uh, fall, this is 2019, how it just starts falling over. And then the uplands kind of showing, we got some good longleaf coming up here. And then our, you know, our lytris is going to seed. And then May is a good time to go see the pickerel weed. So that was last year in May. And this is just kind of showing you what's happening on the, uh, this is a later aerial. So the landowner, you know, cleared their, the neighbor, sorry, cleared their law volume and then now they've planted it back. So that's a concern for us with our burning. We, we have to mm. be careful not to set their woods on fire. Um, and then, so just, as far as our burning goes, we have to be careful about smoke on the road and these trailers over here and the pines, like I said. And um, so Joe Cockrell has been our burn boss the last two burns. And this is the, just an example of a burn plan that he came up with for the last burn. We need an easterly wind to keep it off the road and just shows, you know, the areas of concern. Um, and then we have a little fire break here and this main fire break back here, but then we have roads on the north and south. Um, and the last burn, we had a little spot over right up here and we had Jason Ayers on a four wheeler with his um, water tank, who's able to put it out. And the burn before that, I think we had a spot over, over here and Kathy Boyle is the one that put that one out, even when and she has asthma too. I don't think she's helped since, but, um, so we have decided, I think we need double the number of people next time. So we need people to watch the lines. Uh, um, and here's the burn from last year, showing the fire break. Um, and then somebody found this little scarlet snake, which was actually dead. I was really sad about that, but it's cool to know that they're out there. So I don't know, it just looked so alive, but I guess it died of smoke inhalation. Um, so uh, this is three months after that burn, everything's coming back. 
including our woody plants that we're going to be fighting, but are providing habitat for so many species. And then some of our wildflowers that are blooming after that burn, that they just kind of, you can tell that the burn really promotes flowering. Um, we've got um, Carolina indigo, several species of Baptisia. Um, and some of this was planted and some of this wasn't. We have a lot of Solidago, Lesbedesas, and Desmodium that came up naturally. Um, another little Desmodium. And so Jeff was at it again. He planted some more species this uh, last year. He had some volunteers and here's the list of species that went in the ground last year. And then we were planning a fire this a burn for this year, but um, we've decided to wait till next year just to kind of give it a break because it had, we just burned it. We had a hot burn in May of last year. So we're gonna give the habitat a break um, and work on some, probably some brush cutting and applying for another grant. I mean, not grant, uh, another um, contract for CSP, hopefully to get money from NRCS. And this is the Cambridge drop work last, um, August. And that's, oh. I think that's the end. So, <laughs> anybody have any questions? Uh, I, ha I have some questions. You've answered a lot of my questions I had written down. What, one of them, though, was uh, how do you define a rare plant? Is, is it because it's on the uh, listed, uh, on, as listed federally, or, or how do you really define that? Well, that's a good question. Um, this one, I think they're all, they have, they don't all have the same reason for being rare. I mean, this one in particular, like this, like uh, grows in a specific habitat that's, um, you know, right and left being destroyed and drained and, or, you know, being just left alone and, you know, fire suppressed and grows up to be too shady. So it's, um, I'm not sure if there's a, a one, uh, definition for rare. Uh, um, I think they all have, I don't know. Does anybody else, Lisa, do you have a better answer than that for yeah. that? I mean, they all kind of have their own level, population level that yeah, considered stable. And then like, yeah, how many different places do they occur and how many are in that, po in each population? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, some species have an actual designation um, whether they're threatened or rare or endangered or at risk. Um, and so, you know, those are defined by the, the Fish and Wildlife Service that determines that. <laughs> but there are some, I would say, it's sometimes we interchange unusual or mm -hmm. not found often with rare. Or endemic, <laughs> yeah. Endemic, um, things that are only found in some places. And some of these species that are rare are, have always been rare. You know, they've That's evolved right. in these very unique habitats. Um, and so, uh, they'll always be rare. And that's why we need to preserve a lot of these special places. Another reason, another reason to call it rare is because if you ramble around a lot and you hardly ever see it, it's rare. It's rare. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. I mean, and the, there's, like Lisa said, there's all kinds of designations. So the state, states have their own designations mm -hmm. too. And plants. some of them are tracked or special concern or, you know, there's, it just, I think it just depends on the species and who's noticed it. And, you know, some we have might not have noticed that they're, you know, shrink, they're, you know, starting to disappear, who knows. So do they have to be like an S1 or a G1 to be rare? Um, I, I yeah, I'm not sure if that, if that, the, the word rare is in the definition for those, okay. but there probably is a definition if you look it up for S1 or G1, globally imperiled, or mm -hmm. is that what that means? Yep. Or Sudi, Sudi, you had said something about um, this is a great time to see this and this is a great time to see that. How, how possible is it for us to visit? I mean, if you're going down 301 or whatever it is, is there a place to park? Is there um, I'm going to try to go backwards here and find the map. Uh, 
you also said something about camping. <laughs> well, now, dry now, camping. Like, I mean, that's something that um, in an, I was really just kind of being facetious, but that's something that Jeff has done and John has done, right? And they camp like right here, <laughs> right there. Ooh. Well, I was just they're, thinking about a, a camping area nearby. <laughs> they're probably, um, I'm not sure. There's probably, yeah. what's nearby there? Probably Barnwell, Barnwell State Park. That might be the yeah. closest. Yeah. What was it? Barnwell State Park. It's oh, not okay. extremely close, but it's maybe the closest state closest one. park. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Like if you- but but yeah. if your chapter does, if you all are interested in a field trip, I mean, I think that's something that we can probably set up a time to do that. I mean, fall is really such a pretty time to be out there and the weather is, is a little bit better than summertime. Like um, summer and fall, there's, we have a lot of wildflowers that bloom during that time in the uplands there. So I was just going to say, if you're driving down 301, you know, there's a big um, shoulder here uh -huh. and you can pull over and look into the wetland right here and you can see the um the pickerel weed you know or the irises or the campus drop or depending on what time of year that is but right here is where you can turn in and there's like a yellow sign like a diet like sort of like a bridge shaped sign the the diagonal the um rectangular sign with um yellow reflective mm -hmm. And um, and there's a Bamberg Hunt, Bamberg, Bamberg Hunt Club gate, but it's usually open, and you can park right here on the road and walk. Oh, okay. There's some dog kennels down here. You can park sort of just right in here somewhere. And this is a fire break. You can walk down. And um, we usually just kind of walk like this, and we walk over here, check the Cambys drop board, and. You can walk up on the road and get, you know, you can walk the whole thing. You can walk on the fire break back here. Mm -hmm. And we're friendly with the neighbors. If you see, if you're there and you see some guys coming in in their trucks, um, they know, you know, they know about us, so. Okay. Um, so thank I was, you. I was looking at your, uh, trying to figure out your cycle time here. I think you burn in, 2006, 15, 18, and 20. It, and so every two to three years is about, about the frequency. Yeah, that's what we try to do. And we're trying to vary the seasons. You know, sometimes you can't help what kind of weather you have and it gets delayed. And um, we definitely wanted, to, we wanted to do a growing season burn last time to not to try to not bat the woody plants. So we waited till May. I think most of the time they've been in the fall or the late winter. Mm -hmm. so, so when's a good time to see uh, nesting songbirds there? Um, like May, probably. Yeah. I still have never seen a painted bunting, so. Uh, well, that you should go there because they're there in May. <laughs> you can hear them singing the whole all over the place. Uh, were, were a lot of a lot of the the species that you listed were they already there, or did you select some of those uh, uh, based on experience to, to plug in there? Like, like for instance, what was there uh, Baptisia profoliata there? So that I think um, Jeff planted that, and he planted the other Baptisia too. And I think there is you know one of their reports that they did early on is on the website and it kind of lists out some of the species that he planted. And um, I think it was just, it was based on uh, natural areas in close proximity and what was growing there. So mm -hmm. a lot of the seeds I think were collected from Aiken Gopher Tortoise Preserve. Um, but I don't, he might've gotten them from other places nearby. Yeah. You never know where <laughs> Jeff is, but. Um, yeah, I was just trying to choose the plants that, that, you know, as a botanist or as, you know, we all are stomping around, we know what grows where. And I think that's, they just kind of based it on the sandy, you know, 
coastal plain habitat, longleaf associated species. That's but a lot of, like I said before, we, you know, a lot of that stuff was planted, but a lot of it has come up naturally. So a lot of the, gold, the goldenrods and eupatoriums and um, I think the erythrina came up naturally. So, and oh, the indigophora, they didn't plant that. I think the milkweed came up naturally. So a lot of that stuff, um, you know, didn't have to be planted. Baptista perfoliata is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Cool. I know that's the very cool. You know, like every other slide because it's just really neat. I usually miss it blooming though. I see it like right before it's about to bloom or it's already gone to seed or it's in the winter because it holds on to those leaves and looks really cool. There. The, the plant I like that he planted out there is this dahlia because um, I just don't see it a lot. And it's really cool because it's done well out there. That's it right there. Which one? The, the cursor, um, Dahlia Panada. Um, Put the cursor on. Farewell. Okay, yeah. Okay. So uh, that's in August. So August is a good time to visit too. August and September. October. Do you, do you have a lot of uh, 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 tuberosa, Asclepias tuberosa? There's not a lot, there's just a, a few. Um, and I did, there was one photo at the end, I did find some um, Asclepias um, amplexicollis right next to the road. What about uh, swamp milkweed, incarnatum? I hadn't seen that. Could be out there though. Should be. Could be, I don't know. And we've had, uh, we're up to 19 people now. We have several that have joined us later. And oh, I want good. to tell everybody that we are uh, going, we are recording this and we will have this posted so you can go back and watch the beginning on the native plants, uh, scnps.org after we get it uh, posted to the website. And we still have Lisa to go yet. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. All right. Yeah, let me jump in here and nice to see everybody. <laughs> I'm glad that, that you made it. And um, I'm so glad Sudi showed hers first because really these restoration projects are all about the long game. Uh, it takes a very long time to get where you're going and it's you adapt along the way. It's definitely adaptive management. So this um, property, All right, can you see my screen? We're good. Yes. All right, okay, good. So this is our most recent acquisition um, and you'll kind of see it's, you know, obviously much, much further behind, but I love that Sudi showed this pictures because you can kind of get a vision of, of where we're going with this project. So I'm really excited that we were able to acquire this. Um, you know, it's one of those situations where we, the Native Plan Society has sort of been interested in this property for a long time. Um, and it, it kind of reminds me of the, the Rocky Shoals Spider Lily site, Parks Mill, that it all, all the stars kind of aligned and everything came together at the right time for the Native Plan Society to acquire this property. So, uh, the Kingsburg Bay is an almost 20 acre Carolina Bay. Uh, it's located in Florence County, um, just south of the, the Petey River. Um, so it was actually purchased by Santee Cooper for mitigation purposes. Um, they never needed the property for any kind of mitigation. Um, and then thanks to Frank Holloman, uh, and I think I saw Frank on here. Um, it, he uh, really worked um, diligently behind the scenes um, to help make this happen. So it was transferred to the Native Plant Society in October of 2019. So um, you saw those uh, pictures that Sudi showed of the, of the bay. Um, and this bay has kind of your typical Carolina Bay, this elliptical shape, uh, the right orientation um, for a Carolina Bay. Um, it has some um, historically, uh, historically supported a couple of um, rare plant species. There's that, that name again. Um, it, again, it was um, the Camby's dropwort, um, which is federally endangered. 
um, was observed on this property. And then also this uh, bay boneset or bishop weed. Um, and so the, the bay itself was actually discovered by uh, Richard Porche and Patrick McMillan in 1998, which is the same time that they actually discovered this Carolina bishop weed or bay boneset. So there was some molecular work done and they determined that it is a distinct species. Um, um, and it's probably the mother of another rare Eupatorium uh, known as New England Boneset, uh, which is known to only 15 sites um, in coastal Massachusetts and in Rhode Island. So it's a pretty, pretty interesting and, and neat uh, plant, um, not found in many places, but found in this bay. So this is actually what it looked like. Um, when Richard and Patrick found it, um, it was very wide open, a lot like um, the pictures that Sudi was showing you of the, the Lisa Matthews Bay. Um, there's the, the boneset uh, blooming in the background. Um, and then you can look at this other aerial photo kind of on the down on, on the right side. It was very open historically. Um, and we've heard that some of the landowners around there, or potentially one landowner was burning it uh, pretty regularly at one time. Um, and so it was um, maintained. Um, but then when Santee Cooper um, acquired the bay, they really didn't do much management to it. And as you can see, it became pretty overgrown. So this is what it looked like not too much longer after we, we acquired the property. So um, kind of the, the upland part of the bay um, has a lot of pond pine, a lot of loblolly pine. And that's that picture on the left, it's pretty dense. Um, and then on the, the right side is kind of the more of the interior of the bay. Um, it's still wet, but still pretty overgrown at this point. I've got a video here and I'm, I'm hoping this will play over um, Zoom here. So these are the uplands. Um, there's not, not a lot growing in the understory at this point. So we need, know we need to clear some of those out. Um, and then it kind of transitions more into the, the center portion of the bay um, where it becomes much wetter. And hopefully that kind of gives you a sense of, of what's there right now. So our goals at this point are to, uh, one, uh, restore the historic um, native plant communities. So that's both the bay and a little bit of the, the surrounding upland areas. Um, two, restore the wetland function. So that means re removing those trees that are sucking up a lot of water. Um, and then also there's some kind of cross ditches that go across the property. Um, I'd like to, to fill or, or plug some of those. So basically restore the hydrology as much as we can. Um, and then restore those unique or rare plant species. I think um, we have to sort of wait and see what's there once we actually clear some of those trees off the site um, before we know what we may need to, to put back. Um, but there's some really neat remnant um, plants that are still there. Um, so here's some hooded pitcher plants that we found on the site. And a lot of these can kind of give us an indication of what the plant communities um, used to look like or what they could potentially look like if we do some, some restoration. So um, kind of our initial steps after assessing the property um, in, in 2020, and of course we've We've had COVID and all of that, but we still um, have, have made some headway. So we surveyed all of the property lines. Uh, we had a plat, but just because you have a plat doesn't mean that you necessarily can tell where your, where your property lines are. Um, it was pretty thick and overgrown. Um, and if we're gonna do any kind of restoration work, we wanted to make sure that we weren't crossing over onto any of the neighboring properties, especially if we're burning and we're putting in fire breaks, uh, clearing invasive species, doing all those things. So we got the surveys, uh, surveyed the property lines. Um, we established a small parking area. So we actually had a work day um, last December. So we cleared out uh, the parking area. We were able to install some, some boundary signage. 
Um, one thing I'd like to do this year is um, put up some educational signage for the community. You know, this, this property is in a little bit different place than Lisa Matthews. So Lisa Matthews is in a much more rural uh, community. Um, and this is rural, but there's, there's definitely a, a community. There's houses um, around this property. And so I feel like we, we want to engage them. Uh, we want them to know what we're doing and we want them to feel um, included in, in that. So um, I'd like to put up some kind of educational signage um, and then also continue to do some, some trash cleanup and pickup. Um, it hasn't been cleaned up in a really long time. And also because nobody was there watching it, it was kind of a dumping spot for a lot of different debris. So during our work day, we um, found some, some really neat different plant species that kind of indicated what else might, might still be there. Uh, so pine barrens, gentian, some, a lot of different hooded pitcher plants. Um, and so we're really excited. Milkwort, um, the, a couple of longleaf, big mature longleaf pine, um, a lot of different grasses. So I think um, it'll be really interesting to see what happens once we uh, introduce fire. So our next steps really here are now that we kind of know where our boundaries are, we did some initial trash pickup. Um, we kind of have a better sense of what's on the property is to really do do the restoration, kind of start digging into that. So we need to install the, the fire breaks around the edge of the property. Um, we're hoping to reintroduce fire, do our per first prescribed fire either at the end of this year or maybe in early uh, 2022. Um, we'd like to start getting it on some sort of a regular burn cycle every two to three years if possible. Um, we also uh, want to do a timber stand improvement. So we're hoping over the next couple of years to clear about four acres per year over the next five years and kind of a, a phased um, reclamation um, approach. Um, we could um, clear the entire site, but um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why we, we chose not to do that and kind of take take a, a slower approach to clearing it. Some of it was, some of it was funding, um, you know, some of it was um, just uh, thinking through access, you know, that some of the, the neighbors have four wheelers and um, ATVs and we didn't want to open it up and then have people riding their ATVs around. Um, so, uh, and we also wanted to make sure that whatever we cleared, we were able to maintain um, through brush cutting and, and other means. Um, and then in the uplands, we'll, we'll replant some native grasses and we've got some, some privet to clear. So we were fortunate enough this year to get a grant um, like Lisa Matthews Bay from NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So um, they're providing a little bit of funding each year to do um, some of these practices. So when I say we, um, we do have a, a bay committee. Um, it's sort of an informal committee that's been operating first with the Lisa Matthews Bay, and then I asked them if we could just make it the Bay's committee and we could just, uh, you know, we could all work together to restore these properties. So I would just want to make sure that I give a shout out to um, Sudi, of course. Um, Linda Lee, she's a botanist um, at UGA, the Savannah River Ecology Lab. Jeff Glitzenstein, who's a, a botanist with Tall Timbers Research Station. Um, John Brubaker, who's a longtime member. Of course, Frank Holloman. And then Joe Cockrell is retired from the Fish and Wildlife Service. So we've got a really great, knowledgeable uh, committee that has been working to um, together to restore these properties. And, and then Kathy Boyle also, I don't want to forget her. Um, uh, she's also retired from DNR. So it's good to have all of those different resources and eyes on these properties. So we do have some challenges um, that maybe are a little bit different than Lisa Matthews Bay. Um, one, we have a lot of trash and debris. We got some of it up on our workday, but there's still more to remove. If anybody wants a boat or a toilet, they're welcome to come and get it. <laughs> um, so we've got to figure out how to cut that apart and load it up and get it out of there before we actually do the burn. Um, and then we've got some other pieces of trash, but that one is definitely the most, most daunting uh, to, to haul out of there. Um, we also have heavy fuel loads. You know, this is a property that has pine trees on it that is that have created a lot of litter. 
Um, it also hasn't been burned in a really long time. And we have um, houses surrounding the property. So you can look at that aerial photo there on the right. And there are quite a few houses around there. So we just wanna be really careful about the time of year that we burn, how we burn, um, and how much fuel we add to it when we do the burn. So, um, you know, those are all just things that we uh, have to take into consideration um, as we do each one of these um, different management activities. How you can help. Um, one, uh, trash pickup. <laughs> so I, we had a, the trash pickup and volunteer work day in December. I'm hoping to have another one again, maybe in early May before the weather gets too hot. Um, we wanna make sure that we keep the, the, um, the boundary um, clear so that we maintain the survey lines. So, um, you know, occasionally we'll get out and, and recut those and, and hopefully we'll get a fire break put in uh, this spring. So that may not be that, that big of a deal. So. Um, and then, of course, you know, for any of these projects, um, and, you know, Sudi may not ask, but I'll put in kind of a shameless plug for, for both of these properties and, and for Parks Mill, of course, too, Bill, um, you know, we're, we're always willing to accept um, donations to help with some of the, we're pretty well funded this year, thanks to some donations um, and also the, the native um, or the NRCS grant. So I think we've got enough funds to do the management activities that we need to do this year um, and then in, into 22. Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's about it. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions as well. Okay, I, I have uh, muted most everybody that wasn't already muted. So now, now you can unmute yourself and, and ask a question, but I'll, I'll go ahead and start with one I had. Uh, I, I understand that, you know, as the year goes on, the water depth will, will probably fluctuate quite a bit, but what are the, uh, what would you say the, the range of the depth of these bays are, the Kingsbury and the Lisa Matthews? They're pretty deep. So um, Lisa Matthews, I think we almost got up to our waist mm -hmm. in water. Um, and, you know, that property, there's a lot of water coming off of the road. So there's a lot of sheet flow that flows into the ditch from the road into the ditch. And it actually dumps into Lisa Matthews Bay. Kingsburg isn't quite that deep, um, but it was it was at least up to my knees this winter. So um, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of water in these, but then in the summer they dry completely down, which is, which is what you want. You know, um, Lisa Matthews still holds a little bit of water in the middle, but Kingsburg was completely dry last summer. Lisa, go back, go back to an early, uh, uh, aerial photograph. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I thought I thought I noticed over there on the on the left hand side uh, down near uh, the end of Chanterbury Road. It looked like there was maybe a little bit of a an airstrip there. I don't I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I think it looks like it may just be. I'm, I'm thinking. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking up more like more more closer to Chanterbury Road. Okay. There's a house and a couple of outbuildings there, and a red a house with a red roof. Oh yeah, that's their driveway right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, they, One of the yeah. earlier pictures, it looked like there was a, maybe a little bit of an air strip there. It had more of a defined strip down the middle. Yeah, that's just their driveway. Okay. Um, I should point out too that there um, are a number of. If you look kind of in this right. Um, upper right hand corner there's a bay there I think that might be what we're calling Keith's Bay that Keith Keith Bradley is really interested in and there's a number of other smaller bays kind of scattered around here I um, mean our hope um, let me see on this one so you can see on this one on the left we actually own don't own this very very back part of the bay um, and so we'd like to kind of start picking up, if possible, some of these other pieces as they become available to expand that area, um, just to kind of continue to grow this preserve and ensure that we can keep burning and do all the management activities we want to do. Any other questions?
Any camping nearby Kingsburg? Um, I think at PD State Park is probably going to be the closest. Um, um, but again, if you all are interested in, and Sudi lives up there, so she may know, but if you're interested in taking a field trip to this site yeah. too, there's not a lot to see here right now, but now that we have the parking lot cleared out, there's plenty of parking. So um, even if you want to schedule a group of four or five of you, I'm, I'm happy to, to do that and, and make a trip. So what about your work day? When will that be for the trash pickup and such? Probably sometime in May. I just have to look at my work schedule do you <laughs> and finagle that or do it on the weekend. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'm hoping to do it in May before it gets too hot, maybe mid-May. But I'll send an announcement around about that. Good. Lisa, you want to show them on that aerial where our parking area is? Yeah, yes, and you're welcome to go out there on your own too. Um, let's see. Yeah, so yeah. um, right there where it says Pine Berry Road, um, if you go over a little bit, there's like a little uh, driveway um, by this tiny little gray. I don't know if you can see my little mouse here, but yeah. there's like a yeah. little gray building here. Uh, this, this actually their driveway is actually on our property. Um, so they were happy if we didn't, <laughs> and they were like, you can use our driveway, just don't make us move it. So we're, they said, we're welcome to pull in their driveway onto our property. And then we can actually park um, along this, this power line right here. But there's a little, little cleared area right here, which is pretty easy parking. The neighbor right there was, seemed so, sort of excited that, that we were, you know, kind of messing with the property. She said her mom used to own that back in the day. So she was excited to see us marking the boundary lines, I guess, because she was talking about the, the kids on four wheelers and uh, <laughs> things like good that. <laughs> Virginia, you're muted. Thanks. So the China Berry Road, what town is that, that so we can find it on our GPS? Yeah, it's right outside of Johnsonville. And I can send you, I can send you a link, um, like a Google Maps link to it, but it's on the intersection of Crab Apple and China Berry Road. And if you go to Google Maps and you put Crab Apple and China Berry Road, um, it'll it'll pop it'll pop this pin up. And you would probably access, you'd be coming in from wherever on 378. Um, probably, I guess, from your way, from our way, from my way is 378. Yeah. Um, I think from any direction, you'd probably be coming in. Okay. And what about the other location? You mentioned Highway 301. What town is that? That's connected? eight miles south of Bamberg. Okay. Um, Thanks. But it's kind of near... Um, What's the other little town? Is it Govan um, or Olar? It's one of these. There's a couple little towns just north one of it. those. But it's almost exact from the center of in town on Bamberg, eight miles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we can send you links to both of these so that um, folks will have them and, and can visit. Yeah. The, the thought of seeing a painted bunny that's me very excited. <laughs> <laughs> they better show up this year now that, now that I've said that. That's right. Well, we know I hope we didn't burn up all their shrubs. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be plenty of shrubs. Thanks, y'all. I'm going to run go pick up my kid. Thanks for tuning in. Thank, Thank you, Sudi. Good to see you again. Thank you. Me Thank too. You. Thanks so much, ladies. And thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Virginia, you want to do your... Uh, thing right now all right i'll just give our little report um our state membership is 708 upstate is 319 low country 226 midlands 73 and piedmont 42 thanks judy for sending that um again thanks to our greenhouse steering committee they're getting us ready for our spring plant sale um, 
I, I still have on the agenda about wanting a home show organizer, even though this year, of course, I don't believe we'll be having a home show just because of COVID. Um, our active projects this past year is our master's degree candidate um, got a grant for the Parks Mill site. Our Swamp Rabbit Trail brochures are, are new ones are out. We have eradication uh, of invasives. Then the invasive fig buttercup continues and Blackwell Heritage Reserve. We're also working on invasives there. Uh, money was donated for two land purchases uh, of in, uh, to uh, help endangered plants. Parks Mill and Boone's Creek are the two locations. Um, and just a reminder, if you would like to find out what's happened in the past, we can now access upstate newsletters at the website. Um, and as always, the Native Plant Society works to make the world a better place, one native plant at the time. Mm -hmm. That is all. <laughs> I would.